How are we all? Welcome back to another live here on the channel. Nick here, chatting sports science, chatting everything in terms of endurance performance as well. Uh, great to be back on another live. Sorry I missed last week. I uh, had a few things on, but we're back. We're chatting here today. If you notice the thumbnail and the description uh, and the title as well, we're chatting here about building a race plan and race strategy. And I, I'm not going to bring up too much in terms of showing you things on screen and things like that. What I wanted to mainly talk through initially before we jump into a few uh, Q and A's at the end, if you're going to join us live, chuck your questions in your comments. Uh, in the chat, uh, I'll get back to those where I can and, and, and we'll discuss those later on. But what I want to take you through is just my general process when it comes to building out a bit of a strategy and a plan uh, on race day. What are, the, what are the things that I'm thinking of when it comes to trying to help an, an athlete develop what they're going to do? And this really comes to mind because we've got Melbourne 70.3 coming up this Sunday. So I actually had a race planning session with one of my pro athletes. Uh, that I do some consulting for with yesterday. We we're just discussing some various options. One of those key considerations being, and if anyone's coming and racing Melbourne, or if you are based in Melbourne, the, the one thing that you'll notice is we've had a bucket load of rain, a lot of flooding going on over the last sort of month and a half, which means that at the moment, the recommendation is don't swim uh, in Port Phillip Bay. So uh, the beach that's like literally around the corner from my place, which is the, the bay that we're gonna be swimming in hopefully on, on the weekend, um, unswimmable at the moment. Fingers crossed we can maybe get a swim away uh, on the weekend. Uh, that might change what's going on in the racing. So I know this is then quite relevant in terms of discussing, well, what do we do when things change? Like what happens when it becomes a duathlon? How does that change our strategy? Where do we go from there? So that's what I wanted to talk through. And so I guess the first place I start when I come up with a race planning strategy is we've got to look at the best case scenario first. Like that, that's our optimal. Our best case scenario here is we're going to get a swim, we get a bike, we get a run. For a 70.3, that's a 1.9. We know it's a 90 uh, K bike and we know it's a half marathon. Um, th those, are the, those are the objectives we need to tick off. What do we have to look at first? Well, first and foremost, we need to look at what, what is the course like? Is it, a, is it a dead flat course? Is it a bit undulating? Um, what type of swim is it? Is it an ocean swim? Is it a bay swim? Is it a lake or river canal swim? This all then manipulates how difficult the course might be. And that's something that you're obviously going to go and do when you're selecting and choosing races and being strategic about which races better suit you. If you're looking for a qualifying spot or you're trying to do a bit better, absolutely take all this into consideration. So first we have to assess the course. So I look at something like this weekend, Melbourne 70.3. I'm lucky I pretty much live on the course or halfway down the bike course. I know it's, yes, it's a little bit undulating, but predominantly it's a pretty flat course. It's going to be a fast race. Um, Bay swim generally means that we're going to be quite protected from an ocean perspective. So um, you might get a little bit of current, a little bit of chop, but it's not going to be, you're not going to be having to swim through surf, so to speak. So the swim should be, assuming we get some nice conditions on Sunday morning, the swim, if, we, if it goes ahead, should actually be quite a nice swim. Um, most circumstances, maybe a bit, maybe a bit choppy, which can then separate the better and uh, the better swimmers from the weaker swimmers. But then ultimately the run course is dead flat. Like we, we know this course is generally going to be quite fast. And there was an age group race at the beginning of the year. No pro field, but age group only. We saw some very fast times. We saw a, a lot of congestion on the bike. So these are all the factors that we're starting to, to plan for. And when I'm discussing with athletes going into this weekend, it's it's having a look at some of those some of those factors and, and understanding well what what is this race potentially going to look like from a course perspective. Once we've established a lot of that, the second place I then go is what is physiologically possible for this person? Now, a very, very rough rule for the amateur. I'm talking someone who's likely between, say, a fourth, probably probably slower than a 4.30 total time for, say, a 70.3. But if we look at this as the example because the race is coming up this week, the, the typical amateur is going to be somewhere, like, for the most part, they're going to be able to race around about the top of their zone two, a little bit zone three. So, like, it's kind of four to five out of 10 RPE should be pretty comfortable for most amateurs. Not everyone. Faster you are, the harder you can push. The slower you are, the lower, the lower intensity you're going to have to go to. And it's going to manipulate that. Vast majority of the, the field who are sort of four, four hours 30, 4.45, five hour to 5.30 sort of range heading out. Maybe the six hours we can start. We're probably going to start to have to adjust a bit. For the most part, the bulk of the amateur field that I and the, the category of athlete that I'm typically working with, sort of that middle to upper end age group uh, amateur, take out the pro guys because they're a different different category. Most of those amateurs are going to be sitting around that sort of intensity. So I look at their physiology, I get them in the lab, and 
I may test immediately before the race. I did that with a, a marathon runner uh, about a month and a half ago to some great success. We had a look at his data. We said, for a marathon pretty similar to a 70.3, you're probably going to be sitting up a zone two, heading into zone three a little bit for the typical, again, typical amateur. We had a look at where that was. Sure enough, compared to uh, what that athlete was initially thinking, we actually increased his uh, idea of what pace he could hold by about 10 or 15 seconds per kilometer. Ended up being able to go out and run that and he ran a significant PB on the day and he's really happy with it. So we have to understand what is physiologically possible for us and where what is capable what are we capable of outputting on the day? Part of that we're going to know through our training and our preparation, but part of that we might also um, be able to establish through some later testing in the program. So that might be a week and a half before. Um, definitely something at, at this point in time for a race on Sunday. We're already Wednesday now in here, here in Melbourne. It's the type of thing it's too late to then go and uh, to go and test now. You're, we can go through and have a look at some of your training data, for example. Like when was your last big brick session? So your last big bike and run combo, what were the pacing coming out there, what RPE were you working towards, or what was the type, type of session, was it a race simulation, was it more just a cruisy zone two, we can then sort of get some ideas uh, from that information around all right, how hard might you be able to push, but I always work that in conjunction with, I mean, the, the day is going to throw up different dynamics, we're not entirely sure that how, how quickly it might heat up, it's been quite hot here the last couple of days, and already this morning it's quite warm. So it's the type of thing that on race day, we're going to be starting quite early in the morning. It's not going to be warm, super warm just yet. It'd be quite cool. As the race goes on, it's going to start to heat up. So that's going to change our rating of perceived exertion, our RPE. It's going to change how we're feeling throughout that event. Physiologically, we might be able to output uh, a certain pace, a power or a speed in a normal condition. But as it starts to heat up and we get the sun on us, maybe we get a little bit sunburned as a classic one. That's going to change our... Uh, our sensational feeling of the temperature, which is going to change how we're actually feeling overall, might make things more difficult, might make things more difficult from a wind perspective, like it's quite calm today, we get to race day and it starts blowing a gale, that can throw up all sorts of different different challenges for us, headwind versus tailwind, which parts of the course are we getting each of those, that's going to change all of those factors. So we need to have this balance between knowing what the course is doing knowing what we're physiologically capable of, capable of in sort of a perfect idea, and then also listening to how, how our body's tracking throughout that event. Going out more conservative from a pacing strategy is something that I always sort of recommend. Settle into the race a little bit, and then we can start ticking along. Obviously, at the faster end of the field, you can't actually afford to do that when you actually are racing for wins. Like, it, it, it's on from the start in something like a 70.3. But it's the type of thing that you're much better off being a bit conservative early and then listening to how your body's responding. So settling into the pace that you sort of established prior and have that sort of preconceived idea, settling on the bike, starting to take in your nutrition, get going, all right, how am I feeling? Is this feeling like a three out of 10? Like if this is feeling way easier, okay, maybe I can bump things up a little bit. I'm actually feeling really good. Maybe that extra bit of taper I did or extra bit of recovery a couple of days out has really helped. On the alternate side of things, we start getting into that first 10, 15K, you start getting nutrition in, not feeling great, we're punching into a headwind, this is feeling really hard. Okay, RPE is going to go up, maybe it's a six or seven, that's probably a bit high for where we want to sit for this type of event. Let's just drop back the pace a little bit, get that RPE in check, let's settle in, feel a bit more comfortable, and then we can worry about maybe picking it up back, uh, back again later. Maybe it's a case of maybe I didn't quite taper as well as I'd like. So today's not going to be maybe an optimal, but I just need to keep going and just see if I can work my way into the race a little bit later on. Listening to that combination, looking at your data, keeping an eye on, on what you might be capable of and what you set out prior, but then matching that with how you're feeling is a really perfect balance to be able to then make decisions on the fly. And that, that's a really important, important thing to do is like if you feel like you need to take on a bit more fluid as a result of you working a bit harder, you feel a bit hotter do it. If you feel like you need to take on a little bit more nutrition, like listen to those uh, those signs and symptoms because the body for the most part is going to tell you exactly what it needs and what it wants to do and what it's capable of doing at the time. Um, the more in tune you are with that and the more you listen to that and make, make some educated decisions based on that information that it's telling yourself, the, the better your race is going to go. If we keep just drilling away and going, well, I set out uh, prior to the race saying I could hold 240 watts on the bike for 90 Ks as an example, if you just stick to that and you start feeling rubbish and that's actually starting to push probably a bit too hard and body's starting to really struggle with it, well, it's just going to blow up your run by the time you get to it. But if we listen to that and go, maybe I just need to drop it down a little bit, feel a little bit fatigued, 
feeling like I'm feeling effects a bit earlier than I should be or, or expected, drop it down a little bit, settle in. You never know, you might recover up and we'll be able to go again. Um, it might allow you to slow down a bit to get a bit more nutrition in to then allow you to get, get going and increase that speed a bit later on. So they're really some of the critical the critical aspects. And then the, the, the I guess the final part of it in terms of a planning perspective, is that's, that's looking at, like I said, for the most part, that's going to cover you off in, in optimal circumstances. We know we're getting a swim bike run. We know... Uh, what the conditions are going to be, like, or, or we we sort of plan for the plan for the best case to be able to execute the best race we possibly can. When things blow up, like I said before, this weekend we still don't know. Probably by Saturday, I think they're going to make the call. Um, we're expecting a little bit of rain overnight. I think Friday and Saturday, which might also make it uh, more challenging to get the swim away because the water quality in the bay at the moment is no good. So. What does that mean? Well, there's going to be likely a couple of options. We know that the classic couple of options for um, a race like this that the organizers might go towards. They might still swim. Like there's a chance we still could swim. Um, the swim's not going to get shortened by any means, but it's a case of if the water quality is good enough, like we're going to be swimming. So race will go ahead as planned. If we don't swim though, if the water quality is not good enough, there's a couple of options. There might be a, there might be a run added on at the start that could be somewhere between three and five kilometers potentially. Not in, like that, that's a very rough sort of look at things. I can't imagine it being a bit any more than sort of five k. I think that's probably appropriate. But three to five. Um, what that means is that obviously chase, changes our race dynamic. It might change how you go about that first half an hour to forty minutes. I mean, if you're a stronger runner than swimmer, that's absolutely going to suit you. If you're a stronger swimmer and and maybe not as good a runner, like. Let's, let's be a bit more conservative and, and not go out with those really strong runners in that first 30 minutes or so because that might hurt us later on. It's not what we're used to. It might actually play a bit of havoc with nutrition there. We might be, if you're able to work a little bit harder or, or have to work a little bit harder in that first half an hour or 40 minutes doing a run first, what that might mean is you might uh, need to start taking on nutrition a bit earlier because you'll be burning through your fuel a little bit quicker. Um, so this is all going to start to vary. And so now we need to plan for some of these adverse circumstances. What happens if it is going to be really windy? Some of the other things we need to worry about is, well, what happens if I jump on my bike and as I'm swinging my leg over, I knock my bottle out the back and I don't realize that until I actually want to go grab it and take a drink. I mean, all of these little scenarios we should be planning for in, to some extent. And this is where I'm going to sort of probably take an interesting perspective on this is we should be planning for these scenarios to some extent. All right, if I knock my bottle off, I know the first aid station's about 15 or fifteen or 20 Ks in. Um, funnily enough, the first aid station is actually right out the front of where I live here. Um, so that's probably where I'm going to be setting up on race day. So if you're watching this and you're racing, have a look out uh, on the bike course, you might see me, but um, just watching on from the sides. But all right, I know the first part of it, Maybe I have another bottle on the bike if I'm carrying two. If I knock the first one away, I know the first aid station's only sort of 20 Ks in. I need to make sure I pick something up there. Like that, that's a pretty simple backup. What that might mean, depending on what your nutrition's like, like to use this as an example, if, you're, if you've got a whole bunch of carbs mixed in that bottle and you're worried about knocking it off, maybe put that in a safer position on the bike, like say in the down tube or at the, the, the front of your bike in between your bars, um, your, your aero bars at the front, and then maybe put water in the back because water's easier to replace on course. If you've got two lots of carbohydrate, maybe take an extra one or two gels with you just to make up the difference. So if you're worried about, oh, am I going to get enough carbs in if I pick up a bottle on course? Not really sure what, what's mixed in there, what, what the flavor is going to be like, what the concentration is, how many carb, how much carb is in that bottle, for example. Just pop a couple of extra gels or, or take a, a bar or whatever, you, whatever else you're using have a little backup. You don't have to, it doesn't mean you need to be carrying 15 gels with you by any means, but it's the type of thing, if you're normally carrying two two gels in your pocket, maybe take three or four just in case. I mean, it's pretty easy to go to pull a gel out and drop it. And then if you're going 35, 36, 38, if you're doing the pros and you're 40 plus K an hour, well and truly it's a sort of 45 K an hour plus, you're not gonna you're not gonna have time to stop, go back and get it. Um, it it's just kind of a, a situation you've got to move on. So we need to plan for some of these Little scenarios, what happens if I um, drop something in transition or what happens if I go through an aid station and I, I don't quite get the nutrition I need or, or if I'm going through, like all of these things, appropriate to plan for. My one thing that I, I think you need to keep in mind though is once you've set up a bit of a plan, that's kind of where the, the process stops. 
Um, we, we don't need to keep dwelling on it, thinking about it, constantly going back and going, oh, what if, what if, what if. Come up with a number of key scenarios. So key things I'm talking about are fundamental course changes. So what happens if the swim gets cancelled and it's a run? That's a clear fundamental thing we need to be concerned and, and focused on. What happens if I really I lose a key piece of nutrition? So a bottle that's got all my carbs mixed in it. What happens if I lose that? Okay, I need to find a replacement strategy for those carbs that I'm now missing. I need to get them in somehow, some way, pick something up on course, elsewhere, whatever it might be. Other things that we can't control. What happens if I get a flat tire? What happens if blah, blah, blah. It's like have a backup plan. If you've got some spares with you, like take a, a spares kit. We can't plan for having two flats though. We can't plan for you fixing that that tire and then it, it going on you again. Like I wouldn't worry about stressing on these things too much. We set up some fundamental plans for the main race. We set up a few backup options in case things change, go wrong, alter, whatever it might be. And then that's, kind of, that's where the process is. There, there are our plans. If things happen outside of that, more often than not, they're going to be things outside of our control. We can't control if we get done for a drafting penalty, which I can guarantee if the tech officials do their job this weekend, I can guarantee there will be a number of athletes stuck in that drafting uh, in that penalty tent at the end of the bike purely because there's not that much space on course for the age groupers. Um, it is quite a congested bike course. We can't control that if we get pinged for a drafting penalty or not. That's up to someone else. I wouldn't stress about that. Do everything you can to avoid it. But if that happens, that happens. We can't control if we get a flat tire. If we get a flat tire, okay, great. We, we need to stop on the side of the road. Try and fix it if you've got some spares. We, we move on. Like I wouldn't worry about dwelling on all these things. If you keep knocking your bottle off the bike, like it, we, we drop the first one, we drop the second one, we drop the third one. Like maybe it's just not our day. So uh, think about these scenarios, but... But don't be traveling through them too much and overworking because that's where we burn a lot of emotional and, and, and psychological energy prior to getting into the race, which can actually cause you more often than not a bit more damage than it can do good by thinking through too many scenarios. So think about them now, think about them a couple of days ahead, have some plans in place, have some backup plans in place. But then as the race unfolds, that's where we need to just be calm and relaxed and trust your instincts, trust your decision-making, trust your experience in racing. If you're new and it's your first 70.3 or your first race, you can expect to stuff a bunch of things up. My first 70.3, my first triathlons, all of that that I've done, I've made fundamental errors in those in those events. Something like my first 70.3, I did 2019, my first and only. I really want to get another one done. But an error I made uh, in that event was I took a good amount of nutrition on the bike, but then once I got off, Guts weren't feeling great, so I was like, nah, maybe I won't take any of the gels that I've got. I'll try and go fluids. I really crashed aggressively halfway through uh, halfway through the run because I reckon I ran out of fuel a bit. Part of it was also a conditioning thing. I just didn't build up enough running volume in my prep as well. So at that point, it was too late anyway. I was probably going to fade at some, at some stage, but it hit me really aggressively in that middle part of the run because I was starting to run out of fuel. Why? Because I didn't, I didn't sort of trust myself to take that that additional gel, or at least half a gel, or, or just get something in. I probably left it a bit too late as I got into the run. Maybe even something like taking the gel just before I got off the bike when it was a bit easier might have been a better option. I took one about 15k to go, but I could have taken one with a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes to go uh, on the bike, get it down, settle it, then jump off and start running. That probably actually would have held me in a bit better position. So you're going to learn. Uh, along the way and greater race experience and greater experience is going to lead to better decision making on the fly. So have those plans in place, have your strategy in place, but then be realistic about things can change. This is a very dynamic event. We're talking about four, five, potentially a six hour event for some people, longer for longer endurance. Like if we're talking about Ironman, like you're out there for the whole day. You cannot control for everything that is going to go on. There are certain things you can, like you can control how hard you're pushing yourself on the bike. You can control when you grab that gel and put it in. You can control those things. You can't control a lot of the environment stuff, what's happening around you, all of those other factors. And then once once something does go wrong, you, like, we can't go back and fix it necessarily. Sometimes we can, if you're lucky, but we can't necessarily go back and fix it until it's already potentially a bit too late or we have to just move on from it. And that's what I really encourage you to do is set these plans in place, but don't be, don't be fixated on, I have to follow these specifically to the T because otherwise you'll get yourself into, into some trouble. So they're my tips when it comes to building out a bit of a race strategy and race plan. Let me know, uh, if you're watching this on the replay, let me know in the comments down below, how do you plan for a race? Are you planning for a 70.3, a marathon, Ironman, something coming up? And, and what are the strategy and decisions you're thinking through prior to the race? And then maybe if you've raced recently or if you're watching this post-Melbourne, if you raced on the weekend, um, what, what are the things that you plan for? 
did it go wrong? Did it go well? What were the things you changed in the future? Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, always happy to hear them. So hopefully you got a bit out of uh, listening to my insights on, on how I think about race planning, race strategy. I take all my athletes through uh, a similar process to that. Fundamental basics, plan for some adverse events, but but then from there, we've just got to trust that the, the preparation is the preparation we've got and the strategy we've got in place and what we're going to do is going to take us through and give us a really, really good result on race day. So I'm going to move a little bit into Q&A. So leave your, leave your questions down uh, in the comments. Will, good to see you in the chat again. Uh, nice to be back on lives. Yes, it absolutely is uh, good to be back on the lives. Uh, so thanks for joining us again. Leave your questions in there if you are joining us live or if you're watching the replay, leave them in the comments down below and I might save them for a future live stream. But I'm going to jump into a couple of questions that have popped up uh, in the comment sections of videos uh, on the channel recently, and one that I get a lot, and this is on, is a great question that, that I see uh, a lot of the time, and I've actually done a video on this previously comparing um, chest-based to wrist-based heart rate. Um, but we had a great question from a uh, from someone who follows the channel asking, what's the most accurate heart rate strap on the market? This is an interesting one, and I'm going to answer this not in a really direct way and say a particular brand. I mean, personal preference I've been using the Wahoo ticker um, for quite some time. That's what I tend to use. Reason being, I find, and I really want to preface it with personal, I find it works really well. I like the lights that flash up on it so you know it's connected, you know there's a, the battery's working. Um, it seems to work really well for me. The, the chest strap's comfortable enough. The one thing I will say with the Wahoos, and I'm not associated with any brand in the heart rate space. If someone does want to sponsor me and help me out, more than happy to chat, but... Um, from a uh, from a usability perspective, the Wahoo straps I find tend to last not as long. Like, like I tend to find they perish a little bit easier. The the um, the glue underneath the electrode starts to perish after a little while, and I actually had to replace. Um, luckily, I had a second heart rate monitor the other week because my older Wahoo, um, the little buckle where it clips in on the strap, started to corrode a bit to the point where it actually broke the back of the um, the heart rate monitor. So. That, that's that's not ideal. Um, I have a bunch of clients who use the Garmin's and all variations of the Garmin's. The Garmin Try, the Garmin Pros. The, the I know I, I think about them as, as in the colours. So the red one, the blue one, and the yellow one. Um, some of the older ones work great. I, I actually find the best combination in our lab that we use um, from a testing perspective. The best combination from a connectivity, ease of use, make sure it's working, tends to be the heart rate chip uh, from the Wahoo. Um, the Wahoo ticker, but putting it on one of the old Garmin uh, Garmin heart rate straps, the buckle size is exactly the same, so it just clips straight on. But the Garmin straps are a little bit more durable, so uh, that's the, that's my preference there. In terms of what is the best on the market, they all work great. And and why I said I and and so specific to my personal preference on the Wahoo was because I have chat, I have conversations with athletes all the time, being like, "Gosh, what heart rate monitor should I use?" It's so variable. I know so many people who love the Wahoo. I know a bunch of other people who hate the Wahoo because it never worked for them. Uh, same time, I have a lot of people who love the Garmin straps. I haven't had as much luck personally with the Garmin straps. Um, again, that's just a bit of personal preference. That's the same with using watches and head units and things like that. A little bit of personal preference. Like I like the fact that on the Wahoo, it's got two little flashing lights to tell you that the battery's still working. I mean, that's a really simple feature. But for me, it's a really easy one because I clip it in. I see the lights flash. I know the I know the battery is still operating. If I clip it in, don't see the lights flash and it's not connecting. Well, I know the battery needs changing. So like that's a simple fix. Like for me, it's practicality. Um, in, in terms of what what has been a, a long standing staple in the heart rate space, the polar ones are fantastic. Um, they're really really good from a connectivity piece. Like you just have to go and look at each of the heart rate monitors and think about. Well, how does it connect? Some of them are Bluetooth only. Some of them are Bluetooth and Ant Plus. Some have like advanced running metrics, so like vertical oscillation, things like that. Like, what do you want to use? What do you want to track? How do you want to connect? Um, they're, they're all roughly similarly priced. Like, you, you can't really go wrong with each of them. What I would say, though, is chest strap is superior. I, 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 without, without a doubt, if I'm going to recommend a heart rate monitor, I would go for a chest strap version rather than relying on a wrist-based. Wrist-based can be okay, but like I've got a I've got a Garmin Forerunner 735, got wrist based uh, optical heart rate in the back um, off the little sensor there. Does an okay job. I don't I don't think it really works that well for me. Uh, the optical sensor during my running or my cycling or any of my sessions. I generally go for chest chest based. Um, 
Uh, we go for chest based in the lab when we're testing because it is the most accurate way of looking at it. It's a really direct measure. This is a little bit referred. You can get some differences in terms of how people are moving, things like that as well. How it fits on your wrist is really key. Chest strap, I, I would always more highly recommend. Um, but if you are going to go for a wrist base and you don't like wearing the chest strap, I know for females, sometimes it can be a bit uncomfortable. Some males as well don't like the feeling of the compression of a, a chest strap pushing in on their ribs. I'd go for I'd go for an additional sensor. So you can get like, the, I know the Wahoos do it. I think Polar probably has one as well. All heart rate brands should. Um, you can get like the armband straps. I think they're probably a more practical option, better than the one that's in your watch. Some of the newer watches are pretty good. Like I know the Apple watch does a reasonable job. The new models... Um, and some of the newer garments probably do a better job than this, but I would always tend to trust a chest-based heart rate monitor over um, over the, the wrist. If you are going to use something that's not a chest strap, get an external armband monitor. Um, use it a little bit higher up the arm as, as, as a general sort of rule, but chuck that one on. That generally is going to do a better job. Having said that, we have used the Wahoo ones, the armbands, and compared them. They get a bit they get a bit interesting at about 180 beats per minute plus. So if you're a high heart rate person, I'd be going for chest strap every day of the week. Um, if you're someone who's got a, a pretty sort of low or sort of moderate heart rate, um, particularly when we're talking about it at high intensity, um, then, then either is probably not going to be a bad option. So I don't have any particular preferences. So sorry if I didn't answer the question specifically there on which heart rate monitor should you pick. Um, like I said, though, more than happy to enter it into a discussion around that, uh, maybe offline around what the options are for you specifically, but they're all going to do a pretty good job. I would just generally say general rule, chest strap is the way to go uh, in terms of accuracy. Whichever brand you pick is then going to be down to the other features that you want out of it. So great question, but it's a question that comes up a lot. And I actually did a video comparing chest strap versus wrist space. Um, and, and sort of how they measure and monitor. Long, long time ago on the channel, go back through and have a look. If you, if you jump over to my channel and you, you, you search um, like heart rate, it'll come up in one of the videos. Um, it'll come up in one of the, the, the first videos that I did a long, long time ago. But yeah, great, great question uh, to ask because I do hear that one a lot around. What should I use and, and what's going to be more beneficial for me? All right, clicking into the, the second question now. As I bring this one up on the screen, hopefully it's not... Uh, too small for you to see. There's a lot going on here. And the reason I want to chat through this on here is because it was too long for me to reply in the comments. Um, and what I want to take you through is my thought uh, thought process and my decision process when it comes to answering a question like this. So um, Chris uh, Chris writes uh, in the in the comment section, uh, he's trying out some zone two training. And uh, excuse me just while I read through this because there is a bit of context we need here first. Trying out some zone two training to prepare for an endurance event. Um, I, he used to run in zone three, 40 to 45 minutes, five times a week. Uh, it can hold about a 440 to 450 uh, minutes per kilometer split uh, duration on the run. Uh, he's finding that uh, he can only do fast paced walk without elevating his heart rate to a point where he can no longer speak uninterrupted. So he's finding heart rate coming up quite quickly, I'm assuming in those zone two sessions, finding it hard to keep it low enough, keep the intensity down in those, those easy sessions. Um, bit, of a, bit of a tricky dynamic, but a very common dynamic. Um, which I actually covered it again, similarly, covered this in a video. And I believe this was a response to the video where I talked about difficulty keeping heart rate down, some some uh, factors that might be influencing that. He asked here, could you please share your thoughts on his current situation? He trains about 12 sessions a week. So he's doing a lot a lot of training um, across the training week, with quite a number of sessions. Um, one swimming, 10 land-based, which land-based, I'm assuming we're talking about running, maybe cycling, etc. cetera. Um, one to two strength training, happy to commit to six 90-minute sessions of zone two if he needs to, uh, as long as it, it leads to increased performance. So effectively what he's asking here is what should he what should he do? Um, now there's a lot going on here. We don't know the specifics, uh, and this is something I might have to chat with Chris offline, a little bit more about around the specifics of what event are we training for. That's the key one I look at here and go, great that we're already training sort of 12 times a week. Um, that if that, that works for you and that's what you want to do, you're motivated to train, great. A first go what is the event we're training for? If we're training for a 5K run, are we training for a marathon? Like, are we training for a triathlon? That's going to change what those 12 sessions look like, of course. I mean, you've already got one swim in there, but if you're training for a triathlon, I'd be saying let's probably get two or three out of those 12 sessions uh, a swimming a swimming sessions. We definitely want to increase the specificity there. Um, we want to make sure we've got three or so bike sessions in there, three or so running sessions in there, and then that's going to get us to nine plus our strength sessions is 10, 11, sessions in the week, we might add one or two more, um, maybe add an extra extra ride and an extra run. Uh, there's our sort of 12 plus our two strengths. So 
that's going to look very different to if you're going to go and just be a pure runner, where I might say 12 running sessions in the week is probably a lot, depending on your level of performance, etc. Given the sort of pacing you mentioned there, I'd probably say 12 running sessions in a week is too much. So maybe we go for, say, six running sessions in a week, and we actually cut down the total number of sessions and do, say, five or six running sessions and maybe two to three cross-training sessions. So you might jump on a bike, you might uh, jump on a rowing erg or a cross-trainer or do something different, uh, keep the swim in there, you might add a second swim. So so planning out the week and having a look at what that looks like is going to be very, very um, important in terms of understanding the event you're actually specifically training for. As for developing the, the zone two work, it can be quite frustrating. And for some athletes, it may require a bit of a walk-jog combination to really just try and make, make sure the heart rate stays down. The first part of the equation in that though is one, do we need to be running that low? So where have you established your zones from? Like, What are you defining your zone two as and how did you define it? Um, did you get it from a lab-based test? It, it, I mean, if so, it's probably gonna be highly accurate. Um, in which case, yeah, we, we, if, it, if that means heart rate has to stay particularly low and it means that we can't necessarily uh, run the entire session initially, sure, we might have to do some run walk, um, building out the volume that way, gradually trying to reduce how much walking we've got in there is gonna be a really important factor. Like the more we can run is gonna be key. Of which a second part of that, if you've watched the video where I cover this on the channel, a big factor in that is for most people, it, it largely comes down to a movement side of things and their running technique. Uh, and when I say running technique, more so when they when they are running, or attempting to run at slow, much slower paces at lower heart rates, what we can sometimes get is they revert into more of a walking mechanic, in which case their oxygen consumption goes up because it's less economical. So the slower pace, because of how they're running, they're not getting enough airtime realistically. A, a run, the difference between a run and a walk, let me start there, the difference between a run and a walk is a walk, we always have something in contact with the ground. So there's always a one one of your feet or one of your legs is, is in contact with the ground at all times. Um, a run is different because we have what's called a flight phase or a float flight float phase where we have both feet off the ground at the same time. We are in the air. We get, we're getting some lift and getting some space off the ground, really. So what tends to happen for those from a technique perspective where technique starts to break down a little and we, we're not generating as much of that float or that flight phase and we're not generating any is we revert to just a really fast walking technique. In that circumstance, you go out and deliberately try and walk fast, don't run, but deliberately try and walk as fast as you can. It becomes really hard really quick if you're not accustomed to it, purely because it's not very economical. Like the most economical way to move at that elevated speed is to start to run and get off the ground. But if you force yourself to stay on the ground longer, it's not gonna be as economical, we have to use a bit more oxygen, therefore heart rate is gonna go up. Changing our technique, getting us off the ground a little bit more, being a little bit more sort of light on our feet, a little bit more uh, flight phase in between steps, things like that. Changing a technique aspect, that's going to go a long way. And that, that's where, I mean, if I'm going to give a little shout out here, go check out the balance runner, um, Paul McKinnon, um, run technique specialist. He's got some online resources, which you'll actually find me in, in the back end of some of those talking about some strength, um, strength work you can do in addition to that. But I do all my work with him. He's based in Melbourne. He does some online work. So if you're all over the world, he does consult online. Sometimes he is over in the US. He was there recently. Um, but he talks about a lot trying to generate this flight and flight, which is really important because if we can get lighter on our feet, get up off the ground, we can still run slow with that. What it actually sets up is a much better foundation for us to have a similar technique as we increase speed. We just do things faster, which is a better way to do it anyway. It keeps you a bit... Um, when I say run healthy, bit injury free, things like that, which are bonuses. But what it allows you to do is start to keep that heart rate down and allow you to run more in those those zone two sessions. So that's really key is initially you might have to do some jog walk, work on some technique to be able to generate a bit more flight phase in that, that running is gonna help you there, start to build out the volume. External to that, some things that might help, they're not gonna be directly specific because if we're trying to get better at running and we're worried about keeping our heart rate down in running, we need to be quite specific to that. But in the early phases, apart from just doing some walk and jog, which is potentially an option, because um, we want to generate some just longer turnout adaptation, like this isn't going to take necessarily, this is not going to be an overnight change, uh, even the technique stuff. It's like we, we need to spend some time gradually just getting it down and down and down, which is building volume over time um, and being smart about it. So you, you have like the run walk stuff might have to go on for a little bit until things come down. 
external to the running though, like doing your cross training stuff, if we're purely looking at your, a running focused athlete, jumping on the bike a couple of times a week at very low heart rate as well can be useful. It's going to develop some very general adaptations, increase the size of the left ventricle and the heart, pump more blood per beat. That's a great adaptation to be able to get that heart rate down. The problem with that is if there is an economy issue, so we're, we're in that walking pattern rather than the running pattern, regardless of what you do off the bike, it's still going to be a problem for us when we go back and transition. If we can solve that, what we do on the bike is going to transition for us a little bit nicer. It still won't be perfect because if you want to be a good runner, you need to run um, purely because of that economy aspect and getting used to the running technique side of things. But the general adaptation will carry over. So that's where a couple of times a week off the bike, uh, or on the bike, off legs, potentially swimming or something else is going to develop the general underlying physiology that will help us um, get those sessions done. I, I would probably also be saying, I, I mean, like, again, it's very context specific. Like, like I said before, we don't have the full scenario here. And, and this is where it's very difficult for me to reply to some of these questions in the comments um, on the videos. I have to do it like this. And sometimes I might leave the answer a little bit vague and I haven't given a full amount. It's because it's bloody hard without the full context. Like I don't know any of the details of, of what event we're training for, how much, um, how much that means in terms of uh, type. Like we don't, I don't have any context around what type of sessions we're doing in those twelve, those twelve sessions a week, which does make it hard. So I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I, I'd potentially even say we might even have to reduce the total volume in the training week to increase the quality of the sessions. Like part of your heart rate being elevated may be, I'm, I'm guessing maybe some fatigue related like if you're doing just too much in the week and you're just cooked heart rate's just going to come up real quick as a result body's under the pump already before we even start a session um i'm guessing there that might not be the case it might be the case i i don't know i'm just thinking through all the different factors we have to consider um but that that's really the starting point i start to look at i go we sort of need to make, first and foremost, need to establish are our zones correct? So you're actually looking at a zone two or are we, we miscalculating what zone two means? That's very, very common. I see so many athletes come into the lab and see me and go, I've been trying to run 120 beats a minute. I just can't do it. We get them on a treadmill um, with a mask on, hook them all up, measure their blood lactate that works. And at 145 beats per minute, they're still having a chat to me. They're still very, very comfortable. And I'm like, why are you run, Why are you trying to run at 120? Oh, because a, a generic calculation told me I, I should be running sub 120. It's like, for you, it makes no sense. Like you might be 130, 140, 160 even. Um, it, it's going to be very individualized. So that's the first thing. Set your zones up correctly. Once you've got your zones set up correctly, what are we training for? What does that mean in terms of how many times a week do we need to do certain sessions? But then applying that correct zone too. Maybe working on some things like technique uh, from a running perspective uh, is going to aid getting that heart rate down and allowing you to run rather than run walk. Um, and, and then outside of that, it might be manipulating some of the sessions to, to adjust some, for, some, for some fatigue until we can build up enough endurance and enough adaptation to be able to handle a little bit more as well. So a lot of factors that are at play there and that go into it, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight there uh, in terms of how I think about a scenario like that in terms of manipulating the training to get to get more of the desired effect we're looking for. Obviously, it's quite frustrating for athletes who are in that situation, so I can appreciate that. But we do need to make make some of those changes and tick off all of those boxes to be able to go, all right, if we've ticked all of those off and we're still struggling from a heart rate perspective, it's like, yeah, we, we need to just keep working through, well, what are some of the mitigating factors for that? Um, do we need to start now increasing a bit of volume? Um, do we really need to strip it back and just go and walk walk far, like walk at a sort of moderate to fast walk for a period, really just sort of give everything a reset and then we can start building it back, uh, which could be a last resort option. I don't generally like doing it, but um, if it's a really desperate situation, going out and doing some walking and not worrying about the jogging aspect for a short period um, can actually potentially give us a bit of an effect in some cases. So not, not for everyone, I say that's kind of a last resort. We want to try and get out and run as much as we can if we want to be a runner but it might be an option you need to look at down the track if, if all other options have been exhausted and we're still not seeing much of an effect. That may be a, an, a path we need to go down, but that's sort of a, a further thing we can tick off. So there's a couple of great questions from the channel. Uh, if anyone uh, who's jumping in uh, on the live wants to chuck a question in the, in the chat quickly before we wrap up, or if you're watching this on the replay, leave your comments and questions down below. Um, happy to answer them later on, either in the comment section, a quick reply, or I might uh, do what I've done here screenshot them and bring them up in the next live. Really enjoyed jumping back on uh, and being on the live stream again. Hopefully you've got a little bit out of uh, this one today and, and saw that 
the, in, the different format we've been running with with these lives since we brought them back over the last couple of weeks. Um, again, apologies for last week. I wasn't here uh, on the live, but 10 a.m. Uh, generally when I'm going to try and get on about 9, 10 a.m. Melbourne time, uh, so Australian Eastern Daylight Savings time. It's a mouthful to get out. Um, Wednesday mornings, though, I'm going to be generally jumping on uh, to be able to have a chat. If you can't join us again, the replay goes up immediately after I finish this and I click stop uh, on the live stream. The replay goes up for you to be able to have a look at uh, what went on. You can skip through it, see all the good stuff, um, and let me know again in the comment section down below if you want to keep seeing these lives, but also your questions as well. Happy to answer them later on. So if there's no other questions that are coming through, I appreciate everyone who joined us live today. Um, if you're watching on the replay, thanks for supporting the channel as well. If, you, if you're joining us for the first time, make sure you do subscribe uh, to the channel and keep supporting it. Really enjoying getting some more content up here. Uh, and hopefully as, as the weather starts warm up, we might be able to get a few different things done. I've got some ideas in the pipeline of some videos I want to do. Um, and I've got some, got some interesting things uh, lined up for the next little while. So I might leave it there if there's no other questions or comments. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoyed going through another uh, live with you, talking about some race strategy, some Q&A at the end. Looking forward to seeing you in the next one uh, next week. But other than that, appreciate you joining us, jumping on, answering your questions. And yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.